Okay. So, uh, last week's last week, the topic and the module was about the process of ad advection, right? And um, from a uh, right from a a kind of difficulty perspective, it, advection is on some level kind of simpler than the process of diffusion, right? It, it only involved a spatial gradient, like a first order spatial derivative, right? It, it wasn't a second order derivative. There was kind of that, that weird, uh, that weird circumstance in which we had to be careful about kind of the advection direction. And, and you know, we did the whole upwind derivative, right? Um, so we had to take the, the spatial derivative kind of in the upwind direction. But, um, you know, largely the, the process itself is, is relatively straightforward just in terms of how it works, right? It's, there's just some mean velocity or there's some velocity that is carrying something passively, right, through some media. Um, so there's a few equations, however, and so, so this week's module is about the process of nonlinear advection. And we're not going to go too deeply into it other than to kind of just examine some of the ramifications of nonlinear advection. Um, but um, some of those implications are fairly profound, particularly for systems uh, in which we're advecting velocity, right? In which we're advecting momentum, okay? And so um, there, there are a few of those, there are a few kind of physical processes that this corresponds to. It's mostly, right, when we talk about conservation of momentum of flowing fluids, right? So whether that's water, whether that's air, whether that's actually, you know, intergalactic media, right? If you're modeling galaxies, this process of nonlinear advection is actually, you know, somewhat important, right? So, um, so this is nonlinear advection and I'm, I'm not going to go too much into the into the into the mathematics of nonlinear advection I'm actually going to sort of sidestep the issue we're going to look at it in in the Jupiter notebook for today what I do want to cover is a slightly different way in which we can compute the temporal derivative which gives us slightly better slightly more accurate solutions to solving systems of ordinary differential equations but before we get into that, what I want to do is, is discuss what nonlinear advection looks like and, and where it shows up, right? So, um, so if this were like a dynamic meteorology class or a computational fluids class or a fluid dynamics class, right, um, uh, we would go through the process of, of deriving kind of from first principles um, what are known as the Navier-Stokes equations, right? So my engineer folks, have, did that, does that ring a bell at all or no? So where you may have actually seen the, the, the Navier-Stokes equations um, are the so-called St. Venant equations. So like in fluids, you talk about St. Venant and it being kind of how you overland flow or flow in shallow, shallow systems, right? Shallow water equations. Um, those are kind of a simplification of the Navier-Stokes equations. So the Navier-Stokes equations um, describe the conservation of mass and momentum of a flowing fluid, usually water, right, or air, um, in three dimensions on either a, a polar or a Cartesian coordinate system, right? And inside, right, the, the Navier-Stokes equations, we get terms that look like this, right? So um, in the Navier-Stokes um, common momentum advection terms look like Right, um, u, so this is like a velocity, times the gradient of u 
in the x direction, right? Or there's also a term that looks like this and a term that looks like this. Right, so here we have, this is the fluid velocity in the x direction, right, and this is the derivative of u in the x direction. Okay, so... If we recall back to last week, right, when we were talking about evecting some contaminant and what we were concerned about is the concentration of that contaminant, right? And so our term here last week, instead of a U, right, this was actually a C, right? And it represented kind of the concentration of some contaminant in our flowing fluid. And this was the advection velocity, right? So this is termed a nonlinear advection because it actually makes our differential equation nonlinear, right? We have um, something, right, uh, the velocity times the spatial derivative of itself. And anytime you get that mixing of, in particular, multiplying kind of a variable times its derivative, the problem becomes nonlinear, right? And so what happens with that is that... Um, this, this, the, the mathematics and the numerics get to be fairly complex, right? And, and what we're going to see in the notebook this, this week, um, and we'll move to the notebook after the break, right? What we'll see in the notebook this week is the ramifications of this, these nonlinear advection terms for things like predicting weather, predicting ocean currents, and they're very profound. If any of you have heard of the term chaos before, right? Chaos arises precisely because of these nonlinear advection terms and the need to discretize these equations and solve them numerically. Okay. You may have heard already, like those of you that took fluids, um, kind of a way, a way of sidestepping, like showing all of these complex equations is to say, well, there's no analytical, you know, there's no analytical solution to these equations anyway, so we're just not going to like cover them, right? Like that's a common like thing. I would do that myself. Right, um, but it you know there is no analytical uh, analytical solution. Or there's no closed form solution. We can't write that you know u equals some product of initial conditions and constants. Right, so we need to solve these equations numerically by doing all this kind of like you know finite math, finite differences, finite elements, finite volumes, and the ramifications of that are, are this thing that we'll get into in the notebook that's called chaos. Right. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's not really chaos. It's more called sensitive dependence to initial conditions. But as you might just imagine, that term is rather boring when you compare to saying, hey, it's chaos. Okay. All right. So but first, before we get there, um, and this is kind of important, um, this, is, this is something that was actually covered in the book more towards the beginning of class. We haven't needed to, to encounter it until now. Um, and it's, it's kind of used under the hood of the notebook that you'll be looking at today. And that's, the, um, that's this, uh, this idea of the way that we kind of compute our, our increment, right? The way we kind of solve our delta C by delta T, right? So uh, how we integrate forward our models, right? So we're going to talk about... Um, alternative numerical integration schemes. Okay, and so, so far in class, um, we've used the so-called Euler method okay and if if you remember right 
um, Euler method looks something like this, right? So, um, you know, we had some equation that was like the, the change in mass with respect to time is equal to some function, right? So this was some function um, of, of time primarily, right? And we approximated this using this finite difference right, where this was um, m at some time t plus 1 minus m at time t divided by delta t, right, and we, we solved for m at t plus 1 as just this, right, m at time t plus um, f at t times delta t, right? So, so far we've used this and we've gotten kind of away with it. Um, and we're going to depart from it today. And one of the reasons we depart from this, right? So it, at the end of the day, what we're actually trying to solve for in any equation that looks like this, right, is, is this this function m, right? So this function m looks like something in time, right? It looks like, for instance, the, the mass of carbon in the biosphere with respect to time, or it looks like the, the temperature at a particular level in the soil with respect to time, right? So we're actually solving for a function. We may not have sort of thought of it that way, but we're actually solving for a function m. And all we know about it is its, its derivatives, right? We, we only have m expressed in the form of its derivatives. So when the function we're solving for is very nonlinear, Um, Euler can produce large numerical errors. Okay, and um, to illustrate this, I want to draw a picture. Okay, so so this is our. Right, so, so we don't know what this function looks like, right? Um, all we have, so I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna draw a line on here and say that this is actually what this function is, right? So this is our, this is actually m. So this is, you know, what I, I'm referring to this as kind of the, the truth, right? So... So I want to say this is the true function m known only in terms of its derivatives, right? So we don't actually have m. What we have up here is the derivative of m with respect to time, right, as a function of time. So we have the slope of m with respect to time. And so when we solve this equation using Euler this way, what we're actually doing, right, is we're saying, okay, well, I don't know, you know, I have a guess of what m is here. This is my initial condition. But what I do know, what I do have, is the slope of m with respect to time, right? And if you go back to your kind of Calc 1 definition of 
what the derivative is, right? It's the, it's the slope of a line tangent to your function m at a particular location, right? So what we actually know is the slope of the line that is tangent to this, that's a horrible tangent curve, sorry. Uh, that's slightly better, right? So we know, right, this is our function up here, f of t equals dm dt, evaluated at some time t, right? That's what we know. And so when we're solving numerically Euler, what we're doing is we're saying that this is our approximation of M2. Here's our M, uh, M1, or I'm kind of call this MT. And to be consistent, I'll call this MT plus one, right? And M at T plus one is equal to this function times delta t here, plus m1, m, m at t, sorry. Right, so all we did is, right, this, it's kind of, it's just geometry, right? So this little increment here that we add to m at t is just equal to the slope of this line times delta t, right? That gives us kind of this, this increment here, right? So we're at, always adding these increments that are a function of delta t and the value of the derivative at that point, right? And as you can see here, whoops, This then here is the error of our approximation, right? But again, we don't have a way of really a, a prox, you know, if we don't know what m is, right? Is m, if m is the velocity, is the, is the wind speed here in Boise as a function of time, we don't know what m is. So we don't have very many tools, at least, or it's, it's difficult to figure out what that error is. We can't sort of, there's no true value of m to, to difference it from, right? To figure out like what is, what is the error. Now, the mathematicians in the room will say, well, you can, you can know what the order of that error is, right? By kind of doing your Taylor series expansion stuff, blah, blah, blah. And that's true. If you take a, a finite, math class, and even in, in maybe Diffie Q, right, you, you hear about these kinds of things, right? Order, order of error, right? The error is order something, is delta t squared or delta t to the fourth, whatever, right? So, so we know what the order of the error is, but we don't know what the precise error is, okay? So the question is, is can we do better, right? So can we do better than this approximation? Can we do better than Euler? And the answer is yes. I'm, I'm not going to show mathematically how much better or, or why as much as I'm just going to show you what we're going to do in terms of this approximation. Okay, so here I'm just going to say enter the, this is one of my favorite words in all of math, the Rungakutta, it's a German, I think it's just one person. Is it Runga and Kutta or is it Rungakutta? I think it was just one, one person. Rungakutta, fourth order scheme. Okay, any of you hear of this before? No, yeah, so the, the mathematicians probably have, right? What's that? They're what, sorry? 
It's two different people? Okay. Runga and Kata. Okay. Good Carl, to know. Runga and Wilhelm Kata. Okay, yes. It's, uh, I, my DFEQ teacher was German, and so she said it sort of properly, and so it was, I came to really like the Runga Kata. Um, so what is Runga Kata? Okay. So Runga Kata, I'm going to, I'm going to do this again by drawing a picture, right? So, again, this is T. And this, again, is M. And here, again, is our unknown function M. Here is our initial condition. And um, I'm going to say we want to know, we want the solution out here, right? So we want to approximate this solution. Okay. Now I'm going to switch up the terminology a, a little bit. Um, just to be, kind of be consistent with other texts in which you might see Rangakata, right? So this is going to be, this is going to be T. This distance is going to be H, right? So you can think of H as just being delta T. And our equation here, right, our derivatives equation, dm dt, is just, we're going to refer to that as f as a function of, um, let's say, m and t, right? So our derivative here, the slope of this line is, is a function. It could be nonlinear, right? It's a function of both this initial condition here as well as, as time, okay? Okay, so what Runga Kutta is going to do is we're, we're actually going to approximate the solution here at t plus h over 2. Okay. And, and effectively, um, what we're going to do is, is, again, we don't know the shape of m, right? We don't know m with kind of perfection. But we know, right, we, we have the derivative specified. So as long as we have the a value of m that's realistic and t, we get the correct value of dm dt. We, we just may not be, right, we're, we're approximating, we're doing a linear approximation of, of m itself, right? So our derivatives are correct, right? They're known precisely, but m is not. Okay, so, um, so what we might do, and what Runga Kutta is indeed going to do, is it's going to find the slopes of, of a, a, a bunch of lines here, right, that are a, approximations. So we're, we're going to approximate the value of m here. We're going to compute the slope, right? We're going to use, again, this value we approximate here to compute a slope here, and then we're going to use that to compute a value of the slope here. And then we're going to basically take a weighted average of all of those slopes to get us kind of a, a better estimate of that dmdt, right? So it's still a finite difference approximation. It's just that we're kind of taking a weighted average of slopes, right? So, and what that's gonna look like here is we're going to take, right, so if I draw my slopes on here, right, so there's one slope that we want to compute here. 
right? And then we want to compute a slope here, right? So, and it's, it's going to be tangent here, Right, so, so this slope here is going to be the correct slope. It's just going to be kind of off our line M, right? So there's still a little bit of air, but the slope is correct, okay? And then we're going to use this point again to compute another slope. And then we'll finally, we're gonna use that to approximate this point here. And then we'll use this curve here, or this point here, to approximate the slope at this location, right? And we're going to call this K1, K2, K3, and K4. Okay, all right, so how do we compute them? Okay, so K1 is just what we, is just the standard derivative that we've computed before for, for Euler, right? For the Euler method. So um, K1, which is the slope of the line tangent here, is just equal to this function evaluated at T and our value of M here, that, that our initial condition. Okay, so that's just kind of the, the slope at this line where we know we have this initial condition here. M, right, so this is our known value of M, right? So that is, and again, this is a slope. This is the slope of that line, okay? So now we're gonna march to half a time step ahead and we're going to calculate the slope here as if we were kind of extrapolating with this slope here, K1, to this slope here, right? So what is that? That's K2, and that's the derivative evaluated at T plus H over 2, and our value m plus, oops, k1 times h over 2, right? So this is, if you look at this, this is essentially kind of an Euler approximation to m at this point here using this slope that we just calculated up here, right? So this is that same value of m plus, right? This is our kind of, this is the slope. This is that rise over run. This is the run. So this is the, this is the rise right here that we're adding to our initial condition to get an approximation of m at h over 2. Okay. Okay. So then what we're going to do, so now we have a slope, we have an approximate slope at this location here. We, so we've approximated the slope at this location that's half a time step ahead. So now what we want to do is, again, approximate the slope at this point h over 2, t plus h over 2. But we want to do it with this kind of new slope that we just computed. That's the approximate slope here, right? So this is going to be k3. And it's going to be, it's going to look very similar to the previous one. So it's an approximation at t plus h over 2, but now it's m plus k2 times h over 2. OK, 
Okay, so now we have two approximations of the slope at this location midway between our current time step and one time step ahead. Okay, we have K2, right? This approximation and K3, this approximation here. So now what we want is we want one approximation of the slope at this full time step ahead, right? We, we want to kind of use this information that we just got to now approximate what the slope is at this kind of far end, at the, at the, time, at the next time step ahead, right? So OK, so this is going to be K4. And that's going to be evaluated. So this is our derivative evaluated at time t plus h and a value of m plus k3 times h. So and then to, to just underscore, it's not clear. These are just different approximations of dm dt. That's all these are. These are just different values of the slope approximated at different points on our curve. OK, so that's fine. Well, how do we get the answer, right? How do we boil this down into something that looks like an, an Euler, right? Some slope times a delta t plus our initial condition to get a, our next answer. And we're going to take the weighted average of these slopes, right? So our value, our, our approximation at m at our next time step, t plus 1, is going to equal m at t plus h over 6 times k1 plus 2k2 plus 2k3 plus k4. OK. So is this at a full delta t or a full h step? Okay, if we add up the, co the coefficients of these, of these slopes, right, we get 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 2 is 5, plus another 1 is 6, right? So we have a 6 here over a 6, meaning that this will be at a full h step ahead. And what we can see here is that this is just a, a weighted average, right? So we are weighting the first and last approximations of our slope here, right? So the approximation of our slope at our current time step and initial condition, right, gets a weight of 1 as does our approximation of the slope at a full time step ahead, right? These get a weight of one. And these middle two slopes, right, because they're kind of at a half time step ahead, get a greater weight, right? They get a slightly larger weight. We weight each of them with a weight two, meaning that they kind of are getting the greater weight in, in this kind of weighted average solution to our, right, to our equation. So this is what's known as a fourth order Rangakata This will often be abbreviated RK4, or people will just say RK4. And the error 
of this approximation is order h to the fourth, right? Which is less than the Euler approximation, uh, Euler approximation, which is order h squared. Yeah, so H is like the time step, right? And what's weird about this, this might be what the question is, how is something that has H squared less than an H4, right? So we're thinking of H as small, something that's less than one, right? So when you square it, right, when you, when you take the, when you raise it to the fourth power, it becomes really small, whereas you raise it to the second, po second power, it becomes kind of less small. Yeah, so this is the symbol order, right? So sometimes it's written like uh, kind of a fancy O order, right? Order. Okay. And so what this means, right, is that in terms of orders of magnitude of the error, the order of magnitude of the air will be in the order of h to the fourth, right? Um, and again, this, as I alluded to, right, we, we can't know because we only have this equation expressed in terms of its derivatives. And for a lot of applications in kind of earth and environmental sciences, this curve M, right, or these derivatives, they're, they're like the Navier-Stokes equation, there exists no analytical closed form solution, right? We can't solve it, you know, we can't guess a solution and solve for constants to get the, the correct solution. So we have to solve it numerically. So we'll never know what the actual error is, but the math can actually tell us what the order of that error should be, right? So there will always be error, right? But we can know at least what the order of that error is. And when we solve this equation using this RK4 scheme, we get a lower order of approximation error than if we were using just a standard Euler scheme. Okay? Okay. So before we hit the break, what are the ramifications of this? Okay. So if we just look at this, at this right here, this kind of um, has some immediate implications for us because we actually control what the value of h is, right? So what this is saying is that if we choose to use a more sophisticated numerical s integration scheme, like this RK4 scheme, we can get away with a larger time step than we could with with an Euler scheme, right? We can extend that time step, right? Or we don't have to make that time step as small to get a less error prone solution, okay? Now, and, and is it, that's great you might say, but does that involve more calculations? And the answer is yes, but it's not like N squared application additional solutions, right? It's just three for every variable, right? So we're just doing three more calculations of the slope, right? We already did this calculation when we did Euler. So we're doing three more, right? Three more approximations of the slope. And we still had to do this calculation anyway. It's just that we only had K1. Okay. So, Yes, we do more calculations, three more, for every state variable m here. But that allows us to use a potentially much larger time step, right? Where it means that we don't have to use as small a time step if we were just using our previous Euler scheme, okay? Okay, so are there, 
are there questions about this particular scheme? Um, are there questions about the math? One thing that I, um, one thing I want to say before we pivot to the break on this is that RK4 is exceptionally, Runga Kutta, RK4 is not the only Runga Kutta scheme. I think that, um, I think Worf uses a sixth order Runga Kutta, I believe, right? Which is like this, but as you might imagine, involves two more approximations of the slope. And so the, um, right, the, the weighted average of slopes here looks slightly different. So you can use higher order Runga Kutta schemes. Um, the first order Runga Kutta scheme is just Euler. Right, so Runga Kutta is very common in, in, in nonlinear models in particular, right? So it's, it's used everywhere where we have these kind of nonlinear conditions. RK4 is, is among the most common and most popular because it's fairly simple, right? Like it's just, you know, once you have the, the mental picture and once you kind of write out the algorithm and you kind of realize that like this is just, I'm computing the slope Four different ways and computing a weighted average, then it, you know it's like okay, like I can I can see that. And and in addition to that, there's um, there are and this this is what you'll see in the notebook. There are packages in most scientific programming languages, right? So Python, R, MATLAB, to be able to use RK4 without actually having to formally write it, right? So um, if all we have to do is we have to write our derivatives in a certain way and we can just call an RK4 scheme and say, hey, tell me the value, use Runga Kutta 4 and tell me the value, if I give you this value of M and this value of delta T and any coefficients, right, any constants or parameters, tell me the value at the next time step using RK4, right? Okay, although it's not, I've written it's not tough to write. Right, but there's canned packages to do this. Okay, so let's stop the, with this there, and then when we come back, we'll move to the, the notebook and we'll overview the notebook we'll be looking at today and Thursday, okay?